Okay, this video is about photosynthesis. So we're going to talk about the photosynthesis and the reactions and some variations on photosynthesis. One of the things I hope you notice as we go through these is if you've learned and are starting to understand cellular respiration, photosynthesis isn't that complicated. So first let's talk about who does photosynthesis. So we know that photosynthesis is done by plants. Right? About half, maybe over half of photosynthesis is actually done in the water. So there are algae, which are actually protists. Here's a unicellular protist, which is my favorite, euglena. There are photosynthetic bacteria, phytoplankton. And what's the purpose of photosynthesis? The purpose is to make sugars or organic molecules. And the very amazing thing about photosynthesis is that all the organic matter that you get to build your body is to make amino acids and carbs and nucleic acids and lipids comes from photosynthesis. So whether you eat your fruits and veggies or not, the animal product that you're eating ate the plant product. Because photosynthesis has this amazing way of taking inorganic carbon, so carbon and CO2, carbon from the, uh, the air, and turning it into organic molecules. Now, most people think the point of photosynthesis is to make oxygen, but in fact, oxygen is a byproduct. So let's not put and. Okay, we're going to see that Oxygen is actually a waste product of photosynthesis. So plants are not doing photosynthesis so you can breathe. Plants are doing photosynthesis so they can have sugars because they can't eat. Okay, so they make their own food and then they use those sugars in cellular respiration to make their own energy. So where does photosynthesis synthesis happen and we're going to focus on plants. So you probably know that the chloroplast is the organelle that photosynthesis happens in. Now when you look at a chloroplast I want you to notice that there are two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And hopefully that rings some bells like, oh that kind of looks like mitochondria. Remember that chloroplast were once free living organisms. And in fact, they were once free living prokaryotes. Okay, and this goes back to the theory of endosymbiosis, and we talked about this with respect to mitochondria. And the idea is that these photosynthetic prokaryotes were taken into a cell and that creates this outer membrane. And instead of being digested, they decided to live happily ever after. So remember, endo means inside. Symbiosis means live together. Okay. So certain eukaryotic cells, such as those in some plants and in some protists, can do photosynthesis. Since we're focusing on land plants, there's an important part of the plant you need to know called the stomata. Okay, we're going to talk later about the stroma, so don't get these two terms mixed up. So the stomata is are um, a series of cells that open and close to allow for gas exchange. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So you can see this CO2 is going in, O2 is coming out. So yes, plants produce the oxygen we need to breathe, but they're doing it as a byproduct. They don't need that oxygen. The other thing that happens when stomata open and close is that water can also leave. And we're going to see at the end of this lecture that because of that, some plants have adapted some variations to photosynthesis. Now, chloroplast you can actually see under the light microscope. So you can see these green organelles moving around. And the green color is due to something called chlorophyll. That is the pigment that actually captures the light. So, chloroplasts, stomata, and chlorophyll. Let's look at the chloroplast structure a little bit more. Again, you've seen it has an outer membrane due to the endosymbiosis. It has an inner membrane, and it has these membrane sacs called thylakoids. So if you remember the structure of the mitochondria, the inner membrane is folded in um, inwards and outwards, and it's called cristae. And we talked about how this increase in surface area allows for an increase in ATP production. Well, the same with the thylakoids. The light reactions, which include an electron transport chain, happen on the thylakoid membrane. So if you have lots of thylakoid membranes that contain the pigment chlorophyll, you can do lots of photosynthesis. Outside of the thylakoid is called the stroma. So this is the liquid, oops, not G, outside of the thylakoids but inside the inner membrane. This is where the Calvin cycle uh, happens. Calvin cycle used to be called the dark reactions. Um, got people a little confused, so they went back to the person who figured it out called, I don't know, someone Calvin. Um, let's see, make sure. Um, granum, or grana, which is plural, is what we call these stacks of thylakoids. So here's an image from transmission. electron microscopy and you can see all these cool stacks of granum all these gran and you can see how there's some connections okay so in this lumen you're going to see we produce some uh, uh, or, or sorry we produce a um, proton gradient like we do for cellular respiration that allows, us, allows the cell to make photosynthesis. So the overall reaction of photosynthesis, the reactants are CO2 and water. And we have to put in energy from the sun or energy from other light sources. So it's pretty amazing if you think about it that all plants need, for the most part, carbon dioxide and water, and sunlight. So yes, they do need some um, trace nutrients, just like us, some minerals, 
um, that they get from the soil. And that's why if your soil is depleted in things like uh, nitrogen and other minerals, plants won't grow very well. But the major things that a plant needs to grow are CO2, which is found in the air, and water that they get through their roots. We talked about redox reactions in cellular respiration. Photosynthesis is also a redox reaction. CO2 is reduced, so it gains electrons and hydrogens. So it's reduced to glucose or other sugars. And water is oxidized to oxygen. Okay, so it loses the hydrogen and that goes into some other water um, and the uh, production of sugars. The delta G for this reaction is about 685 kcals per mole. And yes, that's positive. So this is an endergonic reaction. It takes energy to make these sugar molecules. Oops. Okay. This is kind of an overall picture to show you that plants have to do both. So they do both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Because the point of photosynthesis is to make organic molecules. It is not an energy producing reaction. Okay, we're gonna see that ATP is made and then ATP is used. Cellular respiration is what produces your ATP. So plants do both. Okay, so here's the overall equation that you must know. Um, the one I showed you before had um, water on both sides. You can reduce that down into CO2 and water make sugar and oxygen. And you gotta have sunlight. Just like with cellular respiration, I want you to know where the reactants are used and where the products are made. Okay. This is a super important figure. You should write it down, you should print it out, you should know it. Because the other thing that this um, figure shows you is that there are two parts to photosynthesis. The light reactions and the Kelvin cycle. And the point of the light reactions is to make energy for the Kelvin cycle. And the point of the Kelvin cycle is to take CO2 and we call it fix it into organic, organic, organic carbohydrates. So key component that we haven't talked about this semester is light energy. So you have to have light and plants use visible light. This is the light spectrum from gamma rays, which are very um, high energy to radio waves, much lower energy. Right, so these are why we worry about gamma rays and x-rays and UV rays doing harm. The visible light is the light we see. So it has this color spectrum and different plants use different wavelengths or colors from the visible light. So you can see here some absorption spectrums. that show 
plants absorbing light from different wavelengths. It all depends upon the pigments. So the pigments absorb light and this light is energy. So chlorophyll, main pigment in plants, it absorbs in the purple-blue spectrum and it absorbs some energy in the kind of orange-red. But you notice that it doesn't absorb in this green-yellow. This wavelength, this light color is not used by the plants. In fact, it is reflected and that's what we see. So the colors that the plants absorb, we don't see because they're taking in that light energy. What they reflect, what they don't use, is what we see. So that's why most of the plants we look at are green, at least the leaves where they're doing photosynthesis. This graph here is of some photosynthetic bacteria. There are purple bacteria that do photosynthesis and they actually absorb in this green spectrum and they reflect over here in the red and purple. So that's why they look reddish purple. Different plants have different pigments and the more pigments you have, the more of the light spectrum you can use. What's really cool is when the fall comes and leaves turn colors. Well, they're not really turning colors. They're just now showing you their true colors. So chlorophyll is so abundant in photosynthetic plants so that it can do this uh, food making process that that's the color you see. As the plant realizes it's getting close to fall and winter and the sunlight will be shorter, it says, okay, I'm not going to do so much photosynthesis. It's time to go into a kind of a, a plant hibernation. We're going to hang out for the winter. And so the chlorophyll stops being produced and you see things like carotenoids, which are the orange pigments, and phyorythrocin, which are the red pigments and phyocyanin, which are some of the orange pigments. And so you see these beautiful fall colors because the chlorophyll is no longer being expressed. Just in case you are curious, here's the structure of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a big lipid and protein molecule. Okay, so if you look at this structure, look at all these carbon hydrogens. Not a lot of oxygens. Where am I? Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Chlorophyll is a big ringed lipid. What it has in it also are um, ions like magnesium that help it um, grab the energy from light. And that energy from light is called a photon. So a photon is a particle of light energy that can be captured by a chlorophyll molecule. Those pigments. And when the chlorophyll molecules capture that light energy, they pass that energy on to electrons and they boost that electron energy. So if you think back to cellular respiration, we talked about energized electrons being stored in electron carriers such as NADH and FADH2. So here we're starting with electrons and you're going to see that we start with electrons actually from water and then the light energizes them. And if you didn't have anything to do with it, the energy would be emitted as fluorescence and heat. But what we're going to see is we have these light capturing complexes. So this is a photosystem.
And the reason I show you this is because you're going to see on the next slide, we draw the photosystem like this little square or rectangle. When in fact, it's this complex of these pigment molecules and these proteins, very, very complicated systems. But we draw them like a purple box. Doesn't look so exciting. Z scheme. Know this. Be able to draw the Z scheme. Super important because what this is showing you is that we take water and water is split into oxygen and electrons, which you know have hydrogen ions that go with them. And these electrons are um, uh, excited by the light that's moving through these pigment molecules. And those electrons get excited, full of energy, and they go through an electron transport chain, ETC, just like you learned about in cellular respiration. We'll zoom into this in a minute, but what I want you to see is that the electron transport chain is going to produce ATP, just like in cellular respiration. Those electrons are transported, and then they get excited again. And they get excited and full of energy, and then they put, get put onto an electron carrier. In this case, it's NAD plus. And, oh, sorry, NADP plus. Which I will tell you how convenient that the NADP goes with photosynthesis that starts with a P. NAD plus is in cellular respiration. And so we make this electron carrier called NADPH. So from this figure, I want you to see that electrons move from photosystem two through an electron transport chain to photosystem one Yes, it's a little backwards because they actually discovered photosystem one first, then they found photosystem two, already named it, so it seems a little backwards. So it goes from photosystem two through an electron transport chain to photosystem one to finally be put on NADPH. There are two places where light comes into play. Light excites both photosystem two and photosystem one. They have slightly different pigments. And you're going to make from the light reactions, this is the light reactions of photosynthesis, you're going to make ATP and the electron carrier NADPH. So let's look at this a little more closely. Here is your thylakoid membrane. Out here is the stroma, and inside is the thylakoid space or the lumen. All right, so just like with cellular respiration on the inner membrane, the electron transport chain is a series of proteins on the membrane, all organized. You've got photosystem two, photosystem one, your electron transport chain. You have water donating the electrons, producing oxygen, which will be released from the chloroplast, eventually released out of the stomata. And as these electrons are moving down this electron transport chain, that energy is being used to pump hydrogens. Just like cellular respiration. We, whoa, we, whoop, we pump hydrogens into the thylakoid space, into the lumen. So we increase the hydrogen ion concentration, and oh look, our friend ATP synthase the hydrogen ions 
go down their concentration gradient, facilitate a diffusion, and make ATP, just like cellular respiration. Okay. The electrons, after traveling through the first electron transport chain, get another boost of energy from light, and they are then eventually dumped on NADP+, which is the final electron acceptor, like oxygen was in cellular respiration. ATP and NADPH are made in the stroma. And you can see it goes to Calvin cycle. So the light reactions are there to make energy to drive the Calvin cycle. Oops. Okay. This video you can play. And we, oops, I won't, let me write it here. We, oh, interesting. We just talked about non cyclic photophosphorylation. So this is a good little uh, video that shows you the movement of electrons. And if you compare it to mitochondria, you see it's very similar. Okay. Mitochondria makes ATP by oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation. Chloroplasts make ATP by photophosphorylation. Okay, so the energy to make ATP in mitochondria comes from the oxidation of your food. The energy to make ATP in, in a chloroplast comes from the photo energy from light. Both use ATP synthase, both use an electron transport chain, both pump hydrogen, and hydrogen diffuses back down its gradient through the ATP synthase. The big differences are, oops, ah, where these processes happen. If you know this figure, it's going to help you out on the exam. Okay. Again, the summary of what we're looking at, we've just talked about the light reactions, photosystem 2, photosystem 1, electron transport chains. And the point of the light reactions is to make energy molecules that can feed the Kelvin cycle. So as far as your overall equation, Here's where water comes in, here's where oxygen is produced in the light reactions. Kelvin cycle is where CO2 comes in and where the carbohydrates are produced. It takes energy to make sugars from CO2. So the Kelvin cycle is a cycle similar to the citric acid or Krebs cycle that we saw where you start with carbon molecules and you rearrange them and in that process in this case we're putting in carbon and we're getting out oops, out carbon molecules right in um, cellular respiration we were putting in carbon and we were getting out co2 so here we're putting in co2 and we're getting out sugar the first stage is called carbon fixation. And this is so important because only these photosynthetic um, cells can do this. So they can take carbon dioxide from the air and there's an enzyme called Rubisco. So just like ATP synthase, you need to know Rubisco. Rubisco is the most abundant protein on the planet. Okay. 
Rubisco is how plants were first um, kind of genotyped, characterized by the Rubisco they had. Um, and what Rubisco does, and it's an enzyme, even though it doesn't end in ASE, it takes CO2 and it fixes that carbon, so it binds that carbon to this molecule called RUBP. This is called carbon fixation. Fixation means you're binding covalently the carbon into an organic molecule. There's multiple steps, multiple um, carbon um, molecules that I'm not showing you all the details, but what I want you to see is that for every three CO2s molecules put into this cycle, you need nine ATP and six NADPH. NADPH. That's a lot of energy to make a three carbon sugar. We aren't even making glucose yet. We make a three carbon sugar called G3P. Two molecules of G3P will come together to make one glucose or sucrose. So you see uh, this is a half. So this whole cycle has to go around six times. Okay. Basically it has to take in three CO2 molecules twice to make one molecule of carbon, you need 18 ATP molecules and 12 NADPHs. That's a lot of energy. Okay. So the synthesis of photosynthesis, I don't know why that cracks me up when I say that, the whole overall reaction is that you need six molecules of carbon dioxide to make one molecule of glucose. These guys are important in the Calvin cycle. You need, oh, I didn't change it because I took off the other water. You need six, oops, six molecules of water to make, to release six molecules of oxygen. And this is in the light reactions. Right, so the water is brought into the light reactions, the oxygen is produced in the light reactions. Know this balanced equation. Let me go back a slide. Okay, so I want to explain to you why these are called the light and dark reactions. So, the light reactions are called that because they have to happen in the presence of light. If you don't have light, you're not going to make your energy for the Calvin cycle. But, if you have light and store up this ATP, then you can run the Calvin cycle at night, right? Because all you need is the light to make the energy, and you store up the energy, and you bring in the CO2, and you can make sugars at night. So this is why they used to be called the dark reactions. Super important that I want you to understand. Oops, sorry, I didn't need to write race dark reactions. Is this all happens in a single chloroplast? And and plants have thousands of chloroplasts, but that's not the point. What I want you to understand is the light reactions are making ATP and NADPH in the stroma of a chloroplast. That stuff is not going to go to another cell. It's not going to go somewhere else in the plant. It all has to happen 
both reactions of photosynthesis have to happen in the same chloroplast organelle. Don't be tricked, fooled, if I have a question about that. All right. So, <clears throat> you've seen photosynthesis, and what we just covered is called C3 photosynthesis because carbon dioxide is fixed into a three carbon molecule. This works for about 90% of the plants. Okay. But if you're in a hot, dry condition and you're constantly opening and closing your stomata, you're going to lose water. And water, you know now, is essential for photosynthesis. So if you start losing water and becoming dehydrated, you start having a lower photosynthesis output. So some plants have adapted or evolved adaptations to hot, dry climates. And let's look at why that is necessary. So there's this interesting cycle called photorespiration, and respiration is talking about oxygen. So Rubisco, that enzyme that I said is the most abundant enzyme protein on Earth, can bind CO2 and put that carbon through the Calvin cycle to make out to make sorry um, a three carbon sugar. Rubisco can also bind oxygen. So what happens in a plant if the stomata don't open? Yeah. Stomata do not open and release oxygen, the oxygen levels will build up. And when oxygen levels build up, Rubisco can also bind oxygen attach it to RUBP, and it makes a product that can't be used in the Calvin cycle. And what happens in this is, look it, you lose a CO2 molecule. So that's not good. The plants want to take all that CO2, grab the carbon, make sugars. Why would the stomatas not open? The stomatas won't open in hot and dry climates because they don't want to lose water. So plants have had to figure out a way to grab as much CO2 as possible to avoid photorespiration. And there's two alternatives. There's C4 and there's CAM photosynthesis. The only difference between C3, C4, and CAM photosynthesis is how the carbon dioxide is first bound. And there's a little difference between C4 and CAM. C4, I want you to see, has two, oops, oops, that's not my eraser, involves two cell types. One cell type is for grabbing the CO2 and holding on to it and another cell type is for performing photosynthesis. CAM plants have a night-day difference. So at night, when it's cooler and not as, well, obviously not as hot, and so it won't be as dry, they grab a whole bunch of CO2 hold on to it in their cells. And then in that same cell, in the day where there's light, they can perform photosynthesis. So let's look at these a little bit more. The C4 pathway is important in things like sugarcane, corn, crabgrass. And you have to remember that many of these uh, crops we grow were not native 
to the continental United States. For instance, corn is native to Mexico. So a much hotter climate than we have here. So the C4 pathway is especially important in the heat. Okay. So what happens is that the stomata open. Here's your stoma. Stomata is plural. And in this upper layer of the cells, they grab as much CO2 as possible. And they sequester it, which means they hold on to it. And they sequester it in something called oxaloacetate, which is a four carbon molecule. Hence the C4 pathway. So think about this. We've talked about enzymes that can be saturated. If you're giving it so much substrate to work on, you're going to max out the number of enzymes. So instead of letting that go to waste, what they do oops, is they grab the CO2 and they hold it as this four carbon compound. And then as photosynthesis is happening in a separate set of cells, the oxaloacetate can break down and release CO2. Feeds the Calvin cycle. What's not shown in here, and I don't always know why, is the light reactions are happening here too, right? They all have to happen in that same chloroplast. Okay. Sugar is sent to the vascular tissue. Um, the phloem is for food. But what I want you to see is that for C4 plants, they grab CO2 in one cell type, and they sequester it, like a little kid grabbing all the toys and holding on. And then mom in the other cell type says, give me one, and it lets go. Give me another one, and it lets go. And it slowly starts feeding the CO2 into the Calvin cycle. So in the heat, the C4 plants only open their stomata when it's cool. That way they're not losing so much water. The other pathway is very similar. The CAM pathway, this was evolved in whoops, cactus and pineapple and those kind of related where they grew in very dry climates. So in very dry or very low uh, water climates, they will only open their stomata at night. Okay, that's when they have the best chance of not losing so much water because the sun's not out. And so similarly, the CO2 is brought in and put into an organic molecule and just held there all night. And then when the sun comes out and the light reactions happen, the CO2 can be fed into the Calvin cycle and you can make sugars. Stomata are closed. So again, you're building up the concentration of CO2 to avoid cellular, um, not cellular respiration, to avoid photo respiration. Okay, final concept is a couple terms. Autotroph, heterotroph, photoautotroph. Troph means feeding. Auto, you need, no, means self. So autotrophs are self feeders. Heterotroph, hetero means other. So this means they have to get their food somewhere else. So they have to eat. Okay, so we are heterotrophs. Fungi are heterotrophs. A lot of bacteria are heterotrophs. Autotrophs 
can make autotrophs make their own food. So plants and algae and a lot of bacteria are autotrophs. Let's look at this term photoautotroph too. So first question is, can you get your carbon from CO2? If you can, if you can make your own food, make your own organic molecules from CO2, oops, you are an autotroph. And the photo and the chemo say, where do you get your energy from? So if you get your energy from light, you're a photoautotroph. If you get your energy from other inorganic compounds, you're a chemoautotroph. So phototrophs, again, are things like plants, some prokaryotes, some protists, which are single-celled eukaryotes. Chemoautotrophs are all prokaryotes, all types of bacteria. Let's go on the other side. Can you make your own food? If the answer is no, you're a heterotroph. Now, where do you get your energy from? Well, we get our energy from other chemicals. We are chemoheterotrophs. Humans, some bacteria, fungi, many protists. Okay, we have to eat, and then we break down uh, inorganic molecules to get our energy. Photoheterotrophs have to eat, but they can use energy from light. Like, I would love to use energy from light because then I could just nap all day in the sun, right? But that's not how we are. Prokaryotes are the only photoheterotrophs we know. So keep these terms in mind. Review your photosynthesis. Review your adaptations to photosynthesis. And start thinking about how photosynthesis and cellular respiration are similar and different.